All right. Okay. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I think uh, from all over the world, uh, welcome to the talent conversation and uh, virtual hiring and uh, recruiting and uh, talent um, retention. We're so excited to have you here today. My name is Sarah Tadewas. I am uh, the founder and managing director of Icon Jobs. Icon Jobs is a talent and workforce uh, development uh, solution provider based in Ethiopia. Uh, we mainly focus on helping employers uh, uh, find talent as well as uh, uh, training and uh, skills development of job seekers, especially the youth graduates uh, transitioning from education to, to work. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, part of the uh, employment and training uh, government program in the Northern Virginia area. Um, uh, trying to help uh, dislocated workers, uh, youth, uh, as well as immigrants uh, to going, going to back to work and uh, employment as well as entrepreneurship. And um, as part of uh, the Workforce Investment Act, which I think later called uh, the Workforce uh, Innovation and Opportunities Act, I was uh, leading programs for uh, job seekers to have access to employment as well as training and in job seekers and employers also to, to match them uh, with the skilled workers. And uh, the crisis in 2009, 2008, uh, we were very busy trying to operate uh, those programs as well. Uh, this time, I mean, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, I'm sure we have all seen it and we felt it, uh, the crisis, uh, it has some similarities with the 2009 crisis in terms of the employment and the disruption that's created in business. But also I think uh, this is different and unique in terms of the globally uh, impact that is having on businesses you know, employer, and employers as well as employees. So uh, we're here to actually uh, understand how the virtual uh, world is working, the world of work. And uh, recently uh, to actually engage our clients, our customers uh, understand uh, what they're going through, what, what, how they're navigating the new normal of work, and um, as well as uh, what, what are some of the you know, experiences they're experiencing. Uh, so we sent out a survey uh, in collaboration with Kichecho. Uh, Kichecho is a consulting firm based in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, before I speak briefly about the survey, I would like to invite actually Florence to give us a brief introduction of herself and Kichecho. Florence. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here with you, with all of you today. So my company, Kichocheo, uh, my name is Florence Navarro, as you can see on my Zoom. Um, my company is called Kichocheo, which means catalyst. Um, we are a catalyst for growth and we work particularly with um, small, medium size and for purpose companies and nonprofits. We help them, we catalyze their growth by helping them recruit the right talent at the right time. I built this company based on more than 10 years of experience with incubating social enterprises and companies around the world and uh, 15 years of experience with the UNDP, particularly in Africa, which is how I know Sarah. I also want to introduce somebody who is behind the scenes, Danielle McCombs. She's been a phenomenal intern with us this summer. She is a student at uh, Temple University in studying political science as a junior, so she'll be ready for employment soon. Stay tuned. She has been uh, the one organizing, sharing uh, all of this, sending you reminders, making sure the event bright was up to par. So thank you, uh, Danny. And again, as I said earlier, if I don't look at the camera at some stage, it's not because I'm looking at cat videos, it's because I'm looking at the chat. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Florence. And uh, so understandably, uh, this survey actually indicated that, uh, you know, one of the major concerns that employers are facing and concerned about is how to retain their talent, how they can do virtual hiring, 
and how they can manage their staff uh, virtually as well. And uh, the survey was sent out uh, to, we posted it on social media, we've sent it to our clients, and uh, we've received respond, uh, response from all over the world, uh, mainly from East Africa and the US and partially from, from Europe. And the two major concerns, of course, they're, they're concerned about reducing their employees, of course, they're freezing, uh, you know, hires, and of course, they're not sure what to do next, but also there, there are significant number of the employers and businesses that are actually re-strategizing, reinventing the way, uh, you know, they do business and the way they operate business, but also uh, in terms of their hiring and recruiting, uh, they're actually working on reinventing uh, somewhat how they do their, their talent acquisition as well. So today we're so excited to bring you um, this, these three distinguished guests from um, different walks of life. Uh, they've worked globally uh, with different businesses, uh, as well as uh, they're currently leaders and practitioners in the field. And um, I would go ahead and start with, from Chris. Chris uh, Atundo is uh, a senior manager of talent acquisition and capability at Safaricom. He's the founder of uh, African Retooled and also an executive uh, coach practitioner. He started his career as an uh, organizational management consultant for Deloitte and K KPMG. And most recently, he worked for GE as talent acquisition manager. And today, he will be speaking about um, uh, what's changing, what's the new trend in uh, virtual recruiting, and what are the best processes in screening, uh, screening and sourcing and interviewing strategies that businesses are implementing now? And what, what can we do to actually also have an excellent uh, candidate experience? And Chris has a master's degree from the University of Toulouse in France and a bachelor's degree in business IT from uh, Lee Ko Mi Wing. I'm sorry if I <laughs> mispronounced the name. University in Malaysia. Chris uh, is joining us from Nairobi, Kenya. And thank you so much for joining us, Chris, today for this conversation. And our second speaker is Sarah Nidegwa. Sarah Nidegwa is a recruiting, recruitment specialist at uh, Shortlist Professionals at, uh, uh, in Nairobi, uh, and a recruitment firm which has an office in Kenya and in India. She has an ext extensive experience recruiting across mid-level and C-suit positions among East African fast-growing startups and SMEs. And she has previously worked in PR and corporate affairs with focus on employer branding, organizing, and uh, also C-suit events targeting Kenyan employers. And Sarah holds a double major in psychology and public health, as well as a minor in music uh, from the University of Rochester in New York. And she's joining us from Nairobi as well. And she will be speaking today about what do we need to do to succeed in candidate assessment, hiring quality talent, considering the current reality we're in, what is onboarding looking like now, because we know how onboarding is done in the old reality. So then how can we retain uh, the talent we have? How can we retain the talent we're hiring virtually? And what are the biggest challenges and opportunities we see now? And uh, Sarah is joining us from Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Sarah. Welcome. Uh, last but not least, our speaker, Brandon Auser is a director of uh, people operations at uh, Village Capital, responsible for leading all human resources in talent management, including recruitment, um, performance management, and uh, overall support and development of the great people with, that are at the uh, Village Capital. Uh, he has previously worked in the hospitality sector, including in operations management, with Marriott International overseeing budgeting and employee relations and a broad range of hotel operations, including customer facing services. Brandon has a master's degree in human resource management with a concentration in strategic human capital from Georgetown University. And Brandon will be speaking about what are the 
kinds of best practices and technological tools we see now and how can we uh, utilize them in our now new reality of virtual hiring and what are the most important things that business leaders, HR directors, managers uh, need to consider in shaping and designing their recruitment strategies and hiring process structure. Brandon is joining us from Washington, DC and welcome Brandon, Brandon and thank you so much for joining us as well. Thank you. I, and a quick note, I would like to ask you to kindly mute your, uh, your uh, microphones and I would hand on the floor to Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and welcome to all of you from ac across the globe. It's truly a pleasure to connect with you today. Um, Sarah, it would help if I see my slides maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, once again, um, I, think, I think we're all here for different reasons. I, I'm assuming that we're talking to some people here who are talent professionals. Some people are actually senior leaders um, in different organizations. And the challenges that we face as organizations today are pretty much the same. And hopefully we can tackle some of them today together. Imagine a time when a recruiter or a talent professional will be able to advise the business on which roles to hire, when and why, as opposed to being told when to hire. Imagine a time when a recruiter will be able to calculate the business impact of a recruitment that you've undertaken and, and share that information with uh, the ex executive team. This, my friends, is exactly where businesses are today. Um, businesses are demanding of this from talent professionals and it's incumbent upon us then as talent professionals to up our game. So some questions that we will then be asking ourselves is, how do we as talent acquisition professionals keep up with the rapidly changing business needs? Um, the context that we're in today is that many organizations have had to send people home. Um, many organizations have had to relook at the way they do their business. And it's a tough time for many businesses. But irrespective of all of this, businesses are still trying to figure out which are then the right skills to have on board and they're looking to you talent professionals and leaders to help them do that. So how do you keep up with the constant changes? Next week, the demand will be different. How do you demonstrate business impact? How do you design hiring plans for the business? How do you um, track your recruitment activity and see whether or not your candidates are actually dropping off from the process? So these are some of the things that um, any talent professional are concerned with. And therefore, what you have in front of you is strategic imperatives that any um, talent acquisition professional should be concerned with. How can we as talent acquisition professionals forecast? How can we uh, have a scenario in mind before we actually start our engagement? How can we as the business, as the talent acquisition professionals, how can we inform the business based on information that we're seeing out there and therefore inform some of the operating models? How can we um, um, proactively create talent pipelines that will assist the business to quickly fill up any roles that fall vacant? We're all concerned with filling the jobs quickly in the most cost-effective way, and therefore process efficiency is something that concerns any talent acquisition professional. More importantly today, we like to say, um, we like to tell candidates that we like to buy from people who we like, but candidates will also join you if they like you. And therefore the candidate experience becomes very critical. And the business wants to see all this activity and they want to see and, and, and draw insights from all of this. And therefore reporting and analytics becomes very important. And so all of these form, at least in my experience, some of the strategic drivers that are shaping the conversation for acquisition professionals today. What I'm saying is that I dream of a time of a day when my team and the, the, the teams I work with across the globe are able to be proactive in their, in their engagement with the business, as opposed to being told what to do, they are coming and showing their value as talent acquisition professionals. And therefore I'm saying recruitment needs to stop being reactive. We need to start preemptively seeking people as part of a business strategy in advance and, and engaging them before the business um, asks us to. Next slide, please. And so, what, I'm then, what I've then mapped out for you in this uh, short session we have today is the typical recruitment process. We typically 
um, a lot of times in the past, what you had was you would be advised on which role to recruit and therefore you just quickly go into posting a job. But what I'm proposing in this slide here is that there's a stage called plan. A, a plan stage um, did not particularly exist before because like I said, it was primarily you being told this role has fallen vacant, therefore fill the role. But what I'm proposing here is, is the future of recruitment and which is really becoming a reality today is asking the recruitment team and the talent acquisition team to do some form of workforce planning, to come up with some talent demand forecasting. And how you do this is by the use of market analytics, looking at your data internally, looking at your whole value chain, looking at data on exits, looking at data on attrition, looking at data on, on movements within the organization, on promotions, and trying to infer certain things so that you can be able to quickly proactively know which roles to fill looking at the business metrics and, and seeing which roles are, are affecting the, the, the output in, in the business. And therefore, workforce planning is going to become very important going forward. And today, some examples of solutions that are being used are just some of the um, uh, human capital management solutions have embedded in them some workforce solution plans. And I, I, again, I'm not endorsing any particular product today, but Oracle, SAP, um, IBM, these organizations have solutions that have workforce planning um, um, modules embedded in them. And it's very, very practical and very valuable for you as a recruiter and as a talent management professional to have some sight in advance of, of, of where the organization is going in advance. What follows then is the sourcing stage. And this is the stage where the candidates a lot of times are not particularly looking for a job. Some of them are. And like we said, the context where we are today is that there's so many candidates out there who are looking for jobs now that they've been furloughed. Um, but what you have is the organizations looking for very niche skills. And therefore the challenge for the talent acquisition professional today is how do you sift through these thousand, 5,000 applications and find the person that you're looking for? And therefore what we saw in the past is that uh, recruiters used to advertise jobs in the, in the newspaper. We used, to, we used to post and pray that we get the right person. The recruiter of the past used to research make cold calls, almost like a salesman. But today what you have is a lot of passive candidates, candidates who are not on any of the um, social media platforms and are probably not on LinkedIn. Um, what you might find today is that um, some of these candidates are not particularly looking for jobs and they're comfortable where they are. So then how do you as a, a recruiter find these people? And so it's incumbent upon us now, especially in this age where we are working remotely, to, uh, to consider using virtual career fairs. Um, and LinkedIn has, uh, has recently launched uh, a LinkedIn Live facility. Um, I've, uh, last year, we deployed the first career fair in Eastern, Af Eastern Central Africa, where we used uh, Facebook. And what we were then able to do is reach 1 million people in one city at a, very, at, a fr at a fraction of the cost we used to spend before. And therefore, what you're then able to do is quickly target a demographic, engage them in one sitting, share with them about your organization, the other challenge that you face today as a recruiter is that you have different demographics that you're looking to attract um, at the workplace. And therefore, what, 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 what appeals to one demographic is not the same for another uh, demographic. And therefore, as, an, as a recruiter, you need to really up your game in terms of your recruitment marketing. This is a, a new concept, maybe five, six years old, and, and it's now becoming more important. How do you attract? It's not just about finding the talent. How do you then attract it? attracted into your organization. So our focus has always been on talent acquisition, but how do you then attract them to work for you? Um, so what you have in terms of solutions out there are um, you have augmented messaging where um, you have, you can type out a message and it, it customizes the message for the audience that you're using. I would put a caution there. Some of these solutions are still being developed and might not be accurate, but you have content aggregators. I've used a recent solution called Smashfly, which is a CRM which allows you to pipeline your candidates and, and engage them um, uh, throughout the year. There are many other solutions. I captured some names here for you. Again, not an endorsement, particularly on any of these jobs and any of these solutions. Uh, there's Smashfly, there's Phenom, there's Ascendify, there's Avacha. Some of them have embedded application tracking systems in them. So it's a very good solution for you to be able to, to engage your talent proactively before you even post a job. So after you've done the sourcing stage, um, you can then, and you have your pipeline of candidates, 
Chances are at some point, because of process, you will have to apply, I mean, post the jobs. And most of the time in most organizations, we post jobs using application tracking systems. And that in many, in many worlds was digital. That was now the future. In many organizations, having an application tracking system was you had made it. But my friends, that is no longer, no longer enough. You need to then have application tracking systems that are more advanced, that have automated AI screening bots with, embedded in them. You need to have um, solutions that will allow you to quickly sift through or take candidates through the journey in a much easier way. Having the traditional form where you go in and you fill a form, very laborious task, attach your CV, that is becoming very, very um, old school. And, and a lot of times you find candidates dropping off from the process because of that. And, and, and many recruiters then had to go through Excel sheets in the back end, review CVs one by one. And so what you have today is the use of automated AI screening bots, which will quickly pull out for you the right candidate immediately and you don't have to struggle. Um, what you also have is the challenge that recruiters today have is that um, we've not been able to give feedback timely for candidates and therefore you, you, you have a problem with, um, with the candidate experience. And therefore, what, what I'm suggesting is the use of AI to give feedback to candidates. Let me just switch off my alarm. It, it's just letting me know that I have two more minutes to go. So the use of AI to give feedback to your candidates and chatbots, this will really enhance your candidate experience and will ensure that your company remains a best employer, a, a employer of choice. Further down, you then go into the interview and assessment stage. Traditionally, what we used to do is a lot of phone, phone interviews, face-to-face -face interviews. You would have someone call candidates and schedule. But what you have today is the use of asynchronous video interviews where, for instance, HireVue is, is, is a very popular tool. SHL have developed theirs. And once again, these are solutions that allow you to, um, to interview candidates at their own time. It's on demand. Um, what you also have is the use of hackathons, ideathons, um, idea, uh, AI powered skill evaluation. What you have something called remote proctoring where we can tell if you're actually copying or if you're talking to someone and giving you insight into how to answer questions, the use of VR for interviews, this is really the future of recruitment and the future of assessments. Um, so a lot of companies are embracing some of these solutions to be able to make the assessment stage much easier. You're able to assess thousands of candidates very quickly. So recently I'm recruiting software developers in the organization I work for, and I'm using a solution called Codility. Um, and other solutions are, for instance, um, um, a skill, hacker rank, Cora, Metal, Plume, SHL, Pymetrics. These are solutions that are, are, are AI solutions. Some of them are psychometric tests that allow you to assess hundreds of people and thousands of people at a go without, that, without lifting a finger. All you need to do is um, deploy the assessments and it ranks for you the best candidates. And all of this can be done remotely. So finally, uh, once you've identified the candidates, you probably then want to hire them. And so a lot of um, organizations in the past had to have people come into the organization physically to sign documents. What you then have nowadays is digital onboarding where you can actually have candidates sign documents online. You can actually provide for them a virtual tour of your, your facility and even arrange for them to meet some of your staff virtually. And this is all in, in a bid to, to, to ensure that um, you don't uh, um, curtail the process, you're able to still get the best, the best out of candidates, you're able to showcase your organization and all using technology. So what you notice is through our whole value chain today, and I've talked about, you can actually use technology to do all of this and, and therefore do not, be, um, do not be stressed out, even if you're having to work from home as a recruiter, there is still hope uh, you can use technology. And the challenge is that don't just use technology for the sake of using technology, understand your audience, apply it um, selectively, apply it in the right areas so that you don't end up dropping off candidates because of fatigue of the use of systems. Sometimes some of the solutions you choose are not easy to use. And therefore you, you want to use solutions that are actually easy to use and that, are, um, that, that in, um, improve the candidate experience and the employee experience. So with that, um, with the short time we had, I've tried to pack everything together, but this, my friends, is how you can use technology um, to, to ensure that your talent acquisition process is, is, is top notch. Thank you.
Thank you, Chris. <laughs> so, yeah, with that, I want to hand over to Sarah, who can then take us through how to source and how to screen candidates. Yes, um, Sarah yeah. Kenya, yes. Wonderful, great. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for making time to join us tonight. Um, and I think Chris has really set a good pace for us here. I'm kind of giving us a full end-to-end -end, um, view of what the hiring process looks like, or um, you know, as a recruiter, what are some of the key steps between um, starting a job to getting a hire on board and really kind of bringing in what tech we could be able to integrate. And I think um, what I would love to concentrate um, now is as we're talking about the stages across planning, of course, um, and now starting with kind of the advertising the roles and getting the candidates through the process. Just a little bit around that and how we can create easy processes that would allow us to screen, assess, and actually get quality candidates in our pipelines. Of course, you know, one of the greatest challenges um, as recruiters and as talent managers that we get is a lot of times you might post roles and um, even though you do get applicants coming in, the quality of the candidates is not right or um, you're looking for a very specific aspect within a role. And so just to start off kind of looking at the sourcing stage um, in particular, one of the key things that um, is critical is being specific um, and pinpointing the key skills that you are in the market for. Um, so to kind of contextualize this, I would love to give an example. For example, within accounting, um, an accountant within an FMCG setting um, is, is not really similar to an accountant within an NGO setting. One has very strong skills that are focused around cost accounting, inventory accounting, um, and general financial reporting, yes. But then on the NGO end, you, you also have the donor funded reporting aspect that comes in. And so as a recruiter, if I am looking for an accountant to join my organization and we are an up and coming um, SME within FMCG, then it would be of great value um, within, um, you know, posting the jobs and um, kind of, you know, going on different platforms and advertising would be also to be as specific as possible. So looking for somebody who has previous experience within FMCG or extensive experience with cost accounting and inventory accounting. That specificity does really allow you as a recruiter to now target, really target a specific niche, um, um, I'd say talent pool within a general talent pool that would just say finance and accounting. But now already somebody going through your job description or somebody going through the quick advertisement with a link to apply quickly understands that a major key skill that is really important to this role is cost and inventory management. Same thing with um, marketing and communications. One of the things that I, I you know, across working with a, a ton of different clients and a ton of different roles, you do realize that, um, you know, the, the title might be the same, marketing and PR or marketing and communications manager, um, but the organization is looking for a specific um, transferable skill that is really niche to them. So, for example, um, somebody who has worked in mid-tier consumer um, focused uh, products or services may not really transfer well into a BOP type of consumer market. And so being able to highlight the niche area that you're really focused on does really help in the, in the sourcing stage where you are already, you know, by virtue of highlighting this specific niche skill that you're looking for, really targeting the right people to come through your application process. The second one now would be around kind of the pre-screening, what I would say the pre-screening stage. So yeah, you've attracted the candidates to come through, but then how do you, and I really liked um, um, Chris's point to this, which is more, how do you now start to rank these candidates and start seeing um, this candidate is coming in strong, this candidate is not so strong. And one of the ways beyond um, kind of having um, AI driven, um, uh, you know, um, technology to guide in scanning the CVs and looking at different skills would also to just 
curate one or two specific questions that would ask the candidate to share their experience either managing XYZ under one, two, three type of condition that is very specific to what you're looking for and very specific to the niche talent or niche skill you're looking for. That immediately cuts a lot of the uh, murkiness of looking at 100 marketing CVs that have great experience working within marketing, yes, but only three or four of those truly do have experience working um, within the BOP consumer, um, um, consumer sector um, and, and within a financial services setting. And so really, as, as a recruiter, one of the ways to rethink our process, so there's a traditional funnel you know, put the job out there, get a million people, and then slowly and slowly start fitting them into a funnel. Right now with our current situation and how we want to make recruitment efficient, and also to Chris's point, make sure that candidate experience is maintained, that you're not taking people through an application process where they're clearly not a match, clearly not going to make it through the process. So you have a thousand applications, you're only able to interact with about 10 to 20, and you've left 900 people going, oh, they never let me know what happens or there's never feedback. So to be able to really move away from a funnel type of ideology of um, you know, sourcing and screening candidates to a targeted approach. And also to Chris's point, passive candidates, you know, a lot of times some of the great talent may not be actively looking for these opportunities. So leverage your networks, leverage people, leverage ways to be able to reach passive candidates who would be great fit. And I think that, especially with passive candidates, what needs to be really clear comes way at the beginning where Chris was talking about planning. Once you're planning, you're really good at understanding what you're looking for, who you're looking for, and who would be a great fit. And with that, you'd be able to map your market really well. Um, and that means you'd be able to find the right passive candidates to reach out to and the right passive candidates to engage in that process. And so I think all in all, what Sarah, unmute yourself. Sorry, yes. um, sorry about that. That's all right. Um, so I think we need to move away from the idea of casting a wide net um, and then just seeing whatever comes through, but really now starting to have a targeted approach to the type of talent that we're screening and we're sourcing for. Additionally, um, above and beyond kind of the you know, pre-screening is the actual screening. So one of the biggest challenges that, um, especially uh, when you're working with a lot of young and up and coming organizations is a misconception around what the interview process should be. One of the key things, having structured interviews is an anchor. I think that is one of the main things that kind of really makes the um, review process, the screening process, quite objective um, and also allows you as the talent manager and as the recruiter to really be able to compare apples to apples. So you're not really at the mercies of how charming one person is or at the mercies of how well someone was able to articulate the experience, but rather were they able, one, to share demonstrable experience or even showcase tangible, concrete examples of how they've been able to do X, Y, Z in their um, background? Have they been able to, um, you know, if you're looking for somebody who has experience building and man, um, building systems, can they actually point to an experience where they came in, found a gap, and were able to um, develop, design, and implement um, a system that was able to close that gap? Those are really important things. So having structured interviews is definitely a major part of this whole process. And the other one would also be kind of a lot of times, and I think this is where we kind of get sucked into the, um, I would say the, 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 the flurry of things is there's a lot of theoretical knowledge out there. However, if you want to get quality, if you want to make sure that you've hired someone who's good at what they're doing and good at what you hope that they will do within your organization, practicality. Make sure that you're really focusing on what they've been able to do, 
what they've been able to contribute towards. And so I think keeping those key things in mind really does bring a lot of objectivity in how you approach the screening process. And of course, as um, organizations, understand their motivation. Um, and you know, it becomes one of those things where um, for active candidates, of course, there's clear interest. Was it the brand? Is it the opportunity to work on different type of projects? For passive candidates would be, this is an opportunity that would allow them to have, um, to grow in a more, um, in a bigger management position or give them the uh, opportunity to work in a different sector. And so I think once you start getting to understand what are candidate motivations and what's driving them to be interested as well in your role, um, that's one thing that would then, um, um, that's one of the things that you would be able to now push forward and be able to work on um, and really gives you a sense of um, holistic understanding of what the candidate is and um, how well they are adjusted to what you're looking for. Um, and then moving to onboarding or pre-onboarding, of course, one of the challenges of working um, in this um, COVID time, there's a lot of removedness from our traditional ways of onboarding. And Chris even mentioned it is, how do we now get onboarding to be a virtual affair, as opposed to what we used to have, which is a day in the life where a candidate would come, have a day with the office people and have lunch and be able to interact. So how do we take that and take it virtual? How do we create ways to now start slowly integrating these practices and really important parts of the review process of a candidate's fit into now a more um, uh, virtual process. So one of the things is that I would say is, as you're going through kind of um, this virtual processes, there's the meet and greets. Definitely one of the key things that I, I, I would um, definitely um, encourage a lot is the idea of organizing meets and greets between one potential direct reports as well as peers. And this, this is not to say um, it's an official meeting. It's let's get to know you. Let's get to have a session with a candidate, with a potential hire who's gone through the process, has come out strong, and is a step away from now becoming part of the team. And I think that's important because sometimes Someone might catch something that you have missed um, that, you know, through the structured interviews and the like really wasn't something that was highlighted. And someone will see that during their kind of chill, relaxed, get to meet you conversations that they have. Um, and I think, again, another thing is the office buddy system. Um, so at shortlist, we really have a buddy system when where you join, you get somebody who's going to show you the ropes show you how things work. Oh, this is where we have the coffee. This is where, you know, people hang out for lunch. We don't have that anymore. But more importantly, now that we're in this situation, having an office buddy who one, you connect with on WhatsApp and you're able to say, hey, um, I know you're new. We usually have these type of sessions going on, creates a kind of rapport and um, a kind of easing into it that allows this um, new hire to really start getting into the, the rhythm of the um, organization. And so definitely an office buddy system is critical. And this is just to be able to link them up with somebody who has similar interests. And, you know, and this is, this is somewhere where it will put your review chops to the test because you need to match them with somebody, not arbitrarily, but someone who actually would be able to mesh well with this individual, create a sense of togetherness and a sense of um, belonging. And then ab above that, I would say, of course, um, of offices always have like Friday sessions, um, you know, dedicate one of those Friday sessions and have a virtual welcome party where everyone can have a, you know, a nice welcome note that they can hold up to their camera and say, hey, welcome, super excited to have you on the team. That really does create a sense of, okay, yeah, even though we're separated, we're still together. There's a sense of, I have been welcomed. There's a sense of people know I have joined the team. You know, one of the biggest dangers of, um, you know, uh, online hiring and onboarding is someone will go through the whole hiring process, will get onboarded, and no one knows that that there's a new XYZ person <laughs> within the company. And you know, that's one of those things that now, how do you start kind of bridging that gap, which is make sure you're creating fun opportunities virtually for people to meet. 
And then above and beyond that, I would say in these times, especially with retention, I would say is trust and facilitate. What I mean by that is we have now moved away from bodies on seats, in desks, in front of computers working every day to a situation where you need to trust that your employees are able to deliver, they know what they need to do and they can deliver on that promise. And so everyone has ownership of their role, everyone has ownership in their performance. And so there's a move towards results-based performance management, trust and facilitate, of course. Um, with virtual hiring and virtual work right now, working from home is just, one science that all of us are still trying to to learn there's a lot of things that are happening so provide resources that ensure that your your, your employees are able to one try as much as possible to be productive and are able to um, get to that last mile which means being able to do the job even when no one is um, looking at them um, and so my last slide um, maybe we can just move on to that final slide before i hand it over um challenges and opportunities wow um this this was an interesting section for me i think in terms of opportunities there's a lot so one is we have now been pushed into a more structured screening process um where there's less bias around some of the key things that would highlight whether you know we are still able to assess communication and presentation skills but there's now a remove a removedness from the idea of bias towards how someone did something or how someone shook your hand and it wasn't firm enough um, and kind of just move to actually evaluating candidates for the value and the competency that they bring on board. And I think that's one thing that has become really clear. And even going by um, um, Chris's point around that, I think one of the key things around um, when you think about um, saving of you know this structured process there's a sense of you are able to to see candidates in their real essence and being able to um, analyze candidates for their the key skills they're bringing on board and not so much you know how you are able to interact and all I feel like there's a sense of less bias in this whole process the other aspect I think would be um, time saving um, of course, now no travel required. Um, oh, I'm in Kisumu, I have to travel, or I'm in a different city, I have to travel for an interview. It's pretty much, you know, let's get online, this is the link, this is the day. So lots of time saving on that. Other aspect I would think is larger talent pool. Now a lot, a lot of companies are pivoting their business models. A lot of companies are moving towards a now more remote work style, are moving towards more online based work um, and ways to reach their consumers and customers and clients virtually. And with that means that not everybody needs to be situated in an office located at a specific building. And so also as a recruiter and talent manager, that has expanded your talent pool. You can now source from a larger talent pool that is not really um, locked down based on location. And I feel like that's definitely um, a great thing given a lot of times one of the biggest challenges with that is you are finding great talent, but now either have to find other people to come in or um, have to travel have to come um, and relocate. So that's one thing as well. Last minute that I have, I'll cover a little bit around the challenges. So of course, we've all been there. You are <laughs> joining a meeting. The video is not working. It worked 20 minutes ago. I think it's just the idea that we all have to accept that technology can be tricky. And we've all been there and it's not something that's kind of a deal breaker. It's how do you quickly find yourself? And um, I'll take a, a cue from um, Chris, um, who was able to quickly uh, move to his mobile phone yesterday while we were having a meeting and being able to just stay on course and be able to deliver. And so I think one of the key things is just being able to allow um, the space that technology might work or it will fail and having that in mind allows you to be creative in how you now find the next option and always having a, an alternative have a have a plan B that allows you that in case if a fails then B can come in and lastly dry runs and <laughs> I think this is very um, obvious to a lot of us who've done um, 
this online sessions. I think as a talent manager and as a recruiter, one of the things that you can do is really be able to make your candidate feel at ease make them feel like they're about to come in and do everything and so have dry runs with them connect with them a day before the interview so that they're able to come in and do what they need to do and perform really well in that sense and so allow for that opportunity so that they can be able to test the tech you can test the mics and the videos with them and make sure everything's good but i think all in all um, some of these things are easily done and others quite hard to do but over time give yourself the opportunity to experiment as well i think that's me i will um let brandon come on um and give us a um you know a deep dive into some of the best practice aspects that we can now start integrating into our virtual hiring practices all right well thank you sarah thank you so we all have heard of the good old job description um, but I'm here to talk about some tools that I use and I find very helpful. And I think you guys will find helpful as well as you're looking at new candidates. Um, um, one thing in particular is the candidate profile. Um, what the profile candidate profile to me means is making a, is really helpful to make a process more efficient and effective um, when going through the selection or recruitment process. Um, so what is a candidate profile? It's a, a tool that you can use to kind of map out the desired personality traits and attributes needed for a particular role. Now, the difference between a job description and this is that, you know, job description is particularly, you know, talking about the job itself, where it's candidate profile is really getting more to the nice to haves and must haves um, and so on. Um, so that when you're going through a selection process, you're able to, you know, really um, nail down and um, and qualify the best candidates for the role. Now, what I like to do, and kind of what I've mentioned, is um, with the must-haves and the nice-to-haves and, and beyond kind of those normal um, conventional um, backgrounds that you'll see, you know, kind of highlighted in the um, in the job description. Um, this particular process allows you to um, not only narrow, uh, narrow down the candidates, but it also allows you to quickly manage high volume candidates. Um, so Sarah, if you could go to the next slide. All right, perfect. So when we talk about managing high volume candidates, right now we know that there's a lot of people out here in the job market um, and it's challenging for just about everybody to figure out, well, how do I now manage a high level of inbound candidates um, during a time with likely the same amount of resources? Um, so, um, the thing I really like about the uh, candidate profile is once you make that up front, you're able to leverage that throughout your recruitment process. So, for example, when you're sitting down thinking like, you, you know, what is the ideal person that I need, you know, for this team, for this role, what are the skills and all of that, you're able to then design questions that you could use um, in the interview process. Um, that will be helpful, you know, for determining which candidates are best, right? Um, one recommendation that I have is that if you are, you know, some, I know some of you may have ATS systems, others may not, um, and so there's a different, few different methods, but, um, you know, with some ATS systems, you can have questions already, you know, when a, a candidate applies, there's questions that they could automatically get, you know, upon, you know, um, uploading the resume and cover letter and things of that sort. Um, that's really valuable because it allows you to qualify candidates um, quickly um, without having to phone screen all of them and things of that sort. You're able to maybe ask key questions that may be important. Um, you know, one thing that's really important to, you know, um, my organization is, you know, is, is, is passion, is curiosity. Um, and curiosity to us is defined as, you know, someone that's a lifelong learner, um, a lifelong learner. Um, and with that said, so we're often trying to find creative ways to assess that within the recruitment process. Um, because, you know, uh, curiosity and I would also add autonomy are, you know, very core to um, core traits that someone must have in order to be successful within the organization. Now, um, what I would also note, and if we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Sarah, perfect, um, is that, you know, beyond kind of the candidate profile really helping you not only determine, you know, what candidate is best placed for roles, helping you cut down on time and within the selection process, um, allowing you to kind of uh, qualify quickly uh, and efficiently, um, it also gives you the opportunity 
to help support folks with um, you know, make a fair and equitable process within um, the recruitment um, cycle. Oftentimes, I don't know about you guys, but you could be, you know, put a role out there and then next thing you know, maybe something's changed within the organization. And so now you're trying to figure out or, you know, you have met this candidate and that seems great. Now you're modifying your perception or of what the candidate needs are in order to uh, kind of meet uh, you know, and, and then everything kind of gets skewed within that process and that cost, you know, re requires you going back to hiring manager and just all these other things um, that can be, uh, that can definitely yield a longer um, turnover times or, excuse me, recruitment cycles. Um, so that's what I really wanted to mention about the candidate profile. Now, quickly, I know we're um, sensitive on time. I wanted to mention also retention. Um, and kind of the focus on engagement. I think engagement is critical when you're bringing on new folks into the organization. Um, I, you know, one thing that we know is that, you know, uh, a good onboarding plan really yields a long-term, um, you know, uh, retention from team members. We know that there's over, I think Glassdoor said that a solid onboarding process um, yields about over 80% of, um, of, of, of folks acknowledge they were, were, were remain with the organization um, over the long run. Um, what we I like to recommend is using a performance management tool um, to really help check the pulse of your team. So um, at, at Village Capital, we have a lot of distributed teams. So we have offices, you know, not only here in the U.S. but also in the emerging markets. Um, and so for us to be able to keep a pulse on how folks are doing, we leverage different technologies such as small improvements, um, which is a performance management tool that allows um, uh, us to um, ensure that managers and direct reports are having real-time conversations about work. Um, and so these 15 fives, um, or what we call it within our small improvement system, are um, what we have, we call 15 fives in there. Uh, you take have 15 minutes for five questions. Um, and within that process, you know, the goal is that um, by the last day of the month, you, you and your manager take time to answer questions such as, you know, what are you most proud of this month? What are your greatest, what was your greatest challenge? You know, where could you use support? Um, and this platform is really helpful to really get a, to really understand the needs of the team, but also ensure that you're not waiting to the end of the year and then having that conversation about performance, um, you know, then, and, and it's not really a value add uh, to the company because you waited so long. Um, secondly, and really quickly, Office Vibes. Office Vibe is another tool that we use for like a more of a pulse check to really understand how our team is doing. Um, and um, and it, it, it's a basically it helps us measure across 10 different metrics um, to be able to assess, you know, employment satisfaction, you know, wellness, and just a host of metrics um, that we can leverage to um, to better uh, understand our team and their needs. And this is also within the, the scope of new hires as well as our full team. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to, to Sarah to kind of go into Q&A. Great, thank you so much, uh, Chris, Sarah, and Brendan for a really lively conversation that he touched on uh, like how to the job seeker, the recruiters can actually adjust to the new normal, what we can do with the process, how we can map out our processes. Uh, we've prepared a couple of questions when we were talking with Florence. I think if anyone is here um, uh, to ask questions, please, uh, we would like to give you the floor first to, to the participants to ask questions. You can unmute yourself when we would like to, answer, to ask questions. Anyone? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, so thank you for this very important session. I really enjoyed it. I have a couple of questions. Um, actually, one question and then another one. It's just a point of discussion for, you know, for everyone to discuss. One is, <clears throat> so Chris was talking about utilizing technologies and then leveraging on them to actually make recruitment, talent engagement, talent acquisition very easy. Uh, I would like to ask a question on how um, like small startup companies or medium companies would be able to, um, uh, to, would be able to utilize this technology with limited resources and ability to invest in technology. One is that, so what suggestions or what solutions 
uh, will there be for such companies is my question. Um, like my other point is maybe probably it might not be related with talent retention or talent recruitment and talent retention. So it's somewhat related with the general HR spectrum. So my question to the room is uh, what kind of, um, you know, challenge or what kind of environment do we expect during or after this pandemic, COVID-19? What will our major HR priorities be <laughs> in the coming, you know, few months or even now? Uh, like, for example, in terms of workplace culture, how, how do we expect the workplace culture to look like during this pandemic and, uh, and after this pandemic? Uh, what should our um, talent development or learning and development priorities should be? <clears throat> should we focus on um, mental health, stress management, you know, things like that, uh, or employee well-being? So what should be our HR priorities uh, for during this pandemic or even after this? Um, the other thing is maybe related with my first question. So Sarah was was mentioning about the importance of meet and greet, which is an actual human element in, you know, throughout the HR process for the recruitment and throughout onboarding process. So how will we be able to uh, bring in the human element while using technology? Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Chris. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Robert, for the question. It's a very good question. And, and it's a question that, um, typically will emerge when you talk about technologies like these, because a lot of times some of them are expensive. But this is the good news. Um, some of the um, smaller businesses I've seen in this market, in, in the Kenya and East Africa, what they, what they do is they partner with smaller um, SME recruitment firms that have actually purchased or are actually partnered with some of these solutions. So for instance, again, I, I, the, the caveat is that I'm not endorsing any company. The company that Sarah works for, Shortlist, and a, a number of other smaller companies have some of these solutions that they're building from scratch for SME specifically. So what you could do is actually just do some research and we, I could, we could share with you some names of some of the smaller companies that have developed solutions for SMEs. And so you find that they're much cheaper and, um, and, and the, the concept is the same. And a lot of times, sometimes I wish I could use them because they're more nimble, they're faster to deploy, as opposed to some of the big brands, the IBMs, who have a very clanky system sometimes. So that's, I'm gonna take that question and, and, and hand over to Sarah and, and um, my colleagues. Yeah, um, great. Yeah, thanks Chris so much for that. Um, yes, um, so especially for um, small companies and SMEs, um, at Shortlist, we've been able to really try and build um, tools that would help one with um, the ranking of candidates. So you get applicants through and um, you're able to quickly um, see who's performing well, who's ranking top. Um, and at the same time, so one using AI, um, looking at um, some of the keywords they're using as well in their responses. And two, um, like Chris mentioned, we also do have proctoring where we do ensure that if a candidate is taking an assessment um, that is specific to a skill, if, if it's within um, accounting, marketing or the like, or even software as well, we're able to proctor that session. And, and so it's a tool that is um, quite nimble um, and comes in different varieties. And right now, actually, due to COVID, um, we have made this um, a tool um, available to organizations that would be interested to have it for around a month on a trial basis. Um, and it's for free and to be able to just test it out and see whether or not it works for them. Um, and I think um, uh, Florence and Sarah will share a slide where you'll have the contact information on my end and you'll be able to reach me. So yeah, if this is something that is top of mind for you, we definitely have a system that can help with that where you can also create two or three targeted questions that would help you narrow down the pool of candidates that you're reviewing, um, just like we were speaking around being specific and having some pre-screening questions to just make sure that you're targeting the right applicants. And to your question, um, a little bit around, you know, you've you've asked around the human element and technology. Um, 
in real essence, video um, interviews, video sessions do still allow you the opportunity to um, get human interaction cues from body language to communication. Um, and, and even though it does have that sense of you're not together, I think one of the key ways that you can be able to bring a sense of normalcy to it is really putting one, candidates at ease, like we mentioned, be able to run, do previous reruns with them so that they have a sense of how that technology works. And so when you're hopping into this um, interview sessions, there's a sense of calmness. They, 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 they are at ease and are really eager and excited to get the conversation going and are not really um, riling off from not being able to connect and running late. Um, so I think the human element really doesn't just stop with kind of the face-to-face -face interactions. It really permeates through how we make each other feel through these different processes virtually. So as long as one, like um, Chris was mentioning around candidate experience, if they're going through the application process and they're getting their feedback, um, if they're going through the application process and getting to screening and are having virtual interviews, how are we able to make sure that the candidate feels heard and understood and that whole process permeates and kind of still allows them to feel that sense of understanding, um, a sense of knowledge that, okay, this organization really does take care of its people. So I think, you know, virtually, yes, we are not together, but a lot of the small things we might do in the process will add to a sense of understanding and a sense of appreciation as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Is there anything, uh, Brandon, you want to add? Or we can go to the next uh, person who is uh, raising her hand. Nabat Abbas? Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah, for organizing this. Um, and thank you for, for presenting this. Uh, what I'd like to ask is, um, I don't know if it's true in other markets, but at least in my experience in the Ethiopian markets, is something that I've faced quite as a challenge. And my question is that right now, candidates are reluctant to leave their current jobs. Even if uh, we have a job um, that's in line with their long-term career objectives. So what they cite as a reason is the uncertainty. Um, and my question is, how do we take this risk and convince them to make a move to another job? And then conversely, employers, organizations, companies are also reluctant to hire new employees. How do I convince them that they should hire someone as long as they are the good, a good fit culturally and competency wise? I'm asking this because nothing in my training and years of experience have prepared me for working during the pandemic. And I don't know if I'm the only one facing this or there are multiple people facing this. So I'd really like to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Nabat. Um, who would like to take this? Chris, Sarah, Brandon? Sure. Okay, I'm, I'm, Brand yeah. Brandon. Brandon, why don't you go? Uh, right. I'm, I, yes, unmute. All right, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Well, I think that's a really good question. You know, folks being reluctant to take jobs at this time, it's, it's real. It's an honest thing. Um, I think a lot of folks are like, you know, there's stability here where I am. There's, they still have me employed. There's a bit of trust there. Um, and so that, that is to be a little bit understood. But on the same token, I think that one of the, the unique advantages of organizations is to be different in a time where things are very, you know, you know, very standardized and similar. And what I mean by that is, um, showcase your culture of your organization. Show why you are unique and special and, and what kind of makes the organization um, worth that risk. Um, small organizations, you know, definitely have such a valuable opportunity for that where large organizations oftentimes don't really have that flexibility. Um, you know, things that, you know, I've seen done and um, or that I've done is, you know, it's something as small as a virtual coffee. You know, I, I know that sounds weird, but you know, where you are having an interview with someone and you're like, hey, you know, you, you already have likely have their address in the application. Maybe you'll have Uber Eats or something like that or delivery service, give them a coffee and, and then you have a coffee and you're, you know, and you're both there just, you know, having a conversation about the work. Um, now that's a really small, you know, random example, but it's a way to show one, your interest in the fact that, you know, you are, you know, that your organization is unique. 
Um, another example might be, you know, to, you know, show, you know, take, use leverage your social media to show the cool things that you are doing or that organization is doing um, so that, you know, folks can actually uh, get a, a snapshot into the day in the life. Oftentimes folks don't know what they're getting into until they get there. So how might we show, um, you know, the creative, beautiful side of the organization up front to candidates? Um, it's just some ideas that I have, but I, I'll give it over to uh, some other colleagues here to, uh, to share on this. Great. Um, I think I would also add a little bit on that. And yeah, definitely showcasing um, company culture, pivotal. Like I, I definitely agree with Brandon. Um, that's definitely a way to kind of show them what it is that they would be coming to. Additionally, I think this also then boils down again back to us as the talent managers and the recruiters is, and really going towards Chris's point about, we need to stop being in a reactive mode of you need to go recruit for this and be more involved in the planning of it to the point where you'd be able to ask some really tough questions to the team that's looking to hire, to the hiring manager as well, and be like, if we were not to get any revenue, would we be able to support this role over the next one year, two years, three years? Because that's the security, especially in this COVID time, that a lot of applicants and a lot of candidates who you might be reaching out to are looking for. It's that sense of, I would not want to leave an organization that has kept me employed during a tough time to join another only for that organization to not be able to sustain me three, four months down the line. And so I think it's critical for us as well as recruitment professionals and talent managers to really um, kind of also hold the teams internally accountable that great. You may say you have this need, but how do you see yourself funding this role over the next four or five years? Because if we are going out to find people who fit the role and who are strong contenders and bringing their game to this role, we need to assure them that they are, they are going to be secure. And so I think, yeah, I definitely also a point to us um, to be able to um, get our to get our strategic hats on and, and, and not just be operational, but really start becoming strategic. Great, thank you, uh, Sarah. Is there anyone who wants to go for a question? All right, if not, I think we have actually... Sorry, there was one question raised by Rebel okay, that great. I didn't yeah. great. particularly tackle. Yeah, go ahead, please. No, I was just answering Robel's question around what uh, some of the learning, the learning uh, initiatives and what, what, what the, the, the focus should be for, for, for talent managers now in, in, in light of where we are now. I think I can only give you an example of what we are doing where I, I, I work. Um, the focus, like you said, has been on, on mental wellness. Um, we've tried to also tackle physical wellness with a number of webinars, doing um, Zumba sessions. We've done a lot of uh, empowering our leaders on how to manage remote teams, because the truth is, Robert, none of us is actually prepared for this. None of us expected this. And so we're trying all sorts of things. Um, we're also doing, we're trying to do um, meetups every Friday, every other Friday, just to see how we can engage people. Um, because the, the truth is, we need to figure out how to keep guys engaged. The other thing is, um, what is the work ethic? I, I was in a conversation the other day with a, another leader and they were saying, work has come into your personal space. So it's, it's, it's a new, we're all having to figure out what that means and how, you, I'm showing you my, my, my wall here. Um, Brandon is showing us his whole living room, his whole room, we're in his house, you know, and that's a personal space. So it's, it's, a new, it's a new reality for all of us. And so we're, as we go, we're figuring out what, what modules to, 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 to push out, are they effective? We don't know yet. So, but when, the last thing that we're doing that is very effective is every two weeks, we're sending out surveys to, to pulse the organization, to find out how they're doing. And that way then we're able to calibrate our efforts each time and seeing if they're actually effective. I, I hope that helps you Robo, to some extent. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else who wants to go for a question or comment? Mm -hmm. All right, I have a question. Uh, uh, 
if no one is um, wants to go next. So hello. I would like yeah. Air? Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, Jeremy. Yes. Jeremy, go ahead. Hi. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. First of all, um, I would like to echo the over and say that uh, thank you for this uh, excellent session. I have a question around uh, selecting candidate that really fits uh, the organizational culture and, and, and so on. So uh, from what I have here from Christ, it seems like we could leverage AI to help to you know, have an effective uh, hiring process and so on. But I would like to learn from you beyond you know, the organizational feed. For instance, when recruiting is now you know, uh, important to try to not only attract, but also select candidates that have uh, the right character you know, things like uh, resilience, uh, creativities. I really want to know how technology could be leveraged to make sure that, you know, you will be hiring those who are not only, you know, those who are not only, you know, good fit for the organization, but have the right character, have the right, I mean, this, this kind of uh, uh, soft kill that sometimes is really hard to find through the recruiting process. Thank you, Sarah. I want to give you that question, please. Um, great. Um, thank you so much, Chris. Um, um, Jeremy, I think one of the key things, mm -hmm. um, especially around kind of bringing out those key areas, um, is key around the structured interview process, and so one of the key um, I guess tips and tricks I would share is as you as you're thinking around a candidate interview think around four main competencies that you'd want to test in that instance and so for example of course there's a technical or um, functional knowledge that you would be interested in um, and then like you say there's the aspect around culture fit but there's also that aspect around character or resilience or ability to work through ambiguity um, be able to really hone down on those four main competencies that you'd want to look into and I would say this, the internet is your best friend. Um, just go on the internet and quickly just type in what are great questions to ask to test for resilience? What are great questions to ask to test for um, um, humility or how, how to pick out arrogance in a response? Really, when you start reading through a lot of the psychological um, uh, um, articles and blogs out there, as well as interview guides, you start to get a sense of some of the questions that would fit one your current organization and would be able now as you're asking to be able to pull out how a candidate is responding to questions and so i'll definitely say more than anything there isn't a one size fits all but i would say definitely make sure that you're having a structured interview session with the key competencies and key areas you want to look in beyond the functional aspect that we've mentioned and then in that sense, use the internet to now start imbuing some ideas into how you'll ask those questions. And then critical, and this is really critical, be able to know what a good response and what a bad response is. And that now will help you quickly pinpoint whether you're going right or left regarding the candidate. And I think um, generally that's what I would, um, I, I would advise around you know, screening for some of those key competencies around ability to work, ambiguity, resilience, um, dependability, um, you know, focus on performance or results-based aspect. Um, but happy to, um, I, will, I think I will look up a few other uh, blogs as well. Um, if you do follow me or um, add me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to share a few blogs and resources around that because it's something that I've had to learn and it's, it's quite difficult to really pin down, but resources go a long way. So I'll try and share a few of those resources over the next few weeks. Great, thank you, Sarah. I think we have uh, another question. I know we're running a bit of, of uh, time. We're running out of time. 
but uh, I think people want to continue a little bit. If you would like to continue, we're, we're here to stay a little bit. So there is one question that came from at Adanesh. Uh, how can an organization balance assessing talent in terms of current job and current uh, talent as part of career aspiration? I think I believe, uh, how can we assess talent in terms of what the market is looking for right now? And then what the talent current aspiration of the, the job seeker is, is, I think, I believe is the question. So maybe I can add another question. Maybe can, it's kind of related to that. Um, uh, I know we have tackled in terms of what businesses, HR recruiters can also adapt and, and adjust to the new normal. How about candidates? For example, in the Ethiopian context, uh, if I would like it to reflect maybe, uh, 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 you know, Chris or Sarah or Brandon working with the, the emerging markets, that the majority of our job seekers, they don't write uh, great resumes. They don't have virtual, you know, professional footprints. How do you uh, make sure that those are not left out? And then we also engage those candidates uh, to, to be part of the market. And what are the key critical skills they need to develop right now uh, to actually compete and position themselves to the, to the market? So thank you, Sarah. I, I, allow me to take the second question and then I can ask my colleagues to handle the first one. Um, so the second question, I, I have recruited in Ethiopia as well, and I've seen the challenge that is there. I think more than ever now, um, CVs are a good thing to have, but are not everything. A lot of the applications that you'll be engaging with are going to be looking out for keywords. Um, so the, the advice to some of the people in Ethiopia would be, Focus now more on understanding the role profile and matching your experience and, 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 and extracting your experience that will allow the recruiter or the business to see what it is that you bring to the table. So that um, organizations are now even just um, something called CV passing, which just runs a software over your CV and it picks, it picks keywords and that way you then emerge top on a, on a, on a, on a short list. So it's very important that you really capture the right keywords, highlight. It's not so, so much about how well articulated you, you captured your CV, but it's really around the, the key competencies that they're looking for. But that said, I think more and more now, we're gonna do a lot of um, online interviews, a lot of video interviews. So your ability to communicate virtually is going to be important. And I have, I've interviewed people in Ethiopia, and that's the number one challenge I have. Um, Brush up on your, if it's a company that requires you to speak in English, you're going to have to work on it. You're going to have to script your conversation with them and share with them openly that, look, I'm, English is my second language, but I have, I have prepared myself for this interview and I'm looking forward to engaging with you. And talk to yourself in the mirror and prepare for the interview because it's going to be so critical. I think we've always talked about, like Sarah said, um, there, there's a bias when you used to walk into a room, it was all about your presence and how you walked. But now it's really about how you articulate your, your, your pitch, your, how, how uh, some of the, the AI solutions even pick out your, your facial expressions, your micro expressions. I think obviously we shouldn't use those yet, but if I'm watching you in the, uh, um, during the interview, I'll be looking at your, 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 your demeanor and it's still going to matter. So um, definitely um, work, on your, work on your articulation during interviews, practice, practice, practice. Um, if you're going to be supporting candidates through a process like this, work with, work with them through practicing before they go in for interviews as well. Sarah, over to you, Brandon. Yeah, I mean, one thing I would definitely say kind of on that is, you know, there, from an employer perspective, there are so many different ways that you could go about ensuring that folks are, the best candidates are, you know, considered in the process. You know, one thing that we do here at Village Capital is that, you know, we do candidate assignments. We acknowledge that the resume is not really the tell-all and it's not going to necessarily give us, you know, the best candidate or the results. So what we do is for each role, we determine an assignment that gives them a snapshot into the day in the life in the role. Um, but also helps us assess their skills. And I think that's a great way to, um, to really get to understand and know whether a candidate is a great fit. Now, with that said, I will, I, I have to be honest and say that, you know, there are some roles where your resume and cover letter will, will matter. 
Um, you know, when I talked about earlier in the session about, you know, screening candidates based upon a candidate profile, you know, if I'm hiring for a marketing role and they're in a candidate and submits a resume that is, or cover letter that is, you know, poorly formatted and all of that, you know, then I'm not going to hire them for the marketing position because, you know, if they can't market themselves, that's pretty, pretty much a telltale sign of how they may perform within the organization. So those are things that, you know, I, I think that we consider to do. So um, uh, implementing a candidate assignment to really assess skills beyond the resume, um, but also acknowledging that sometimes a resume can help you understand who's the, the right fit, depending upon the role. Great, thank you so much. I think questions are coming in, but I think we have to wrap up around like 2.30. Uh, so if there is one more question, we can go ahead and then we'll be closing. But uh, this conversation is going to continue. This is our first one. And then we're, ha we're planning to have continuous conversations regarding this uh, talent uh, and recruitment and uh, workforce development areas related to that. So I would like to, to really, uh, if there is any one pressing question, I would give one opportunity to one uh, participant. I think there's one in the chat. There's one in the chat. Okay, yes. Yeah. How to manage and correct biased hiring manager during the interview, any tips? Ooh. <laughs> That's a That's good a one, right? Negative. I think I'm a, I, I, if I'll take that really quickly, uh, but kind of going to Sarah's and Chris's points earlier, I'm really talking on the structured interview and the value of it. So we have a multi-step process. So we have a phone screen, um, we have a hiring manager meeting or interview, and then we have a panel, or excuse me, a candidate assignment and a panel interview. So we are multi-step process. Um, yes, we know that's a long cycle and everyone can't necessarily integrate that into their process. However, um, we acknowledge it allows us to really mitigate the bias when we're selecting or looking for and searching for candidates. Um, um, one thing that I'll also mention is that when you're doing the structured interviews, like you and doing panel interviews, we literally break it down to who's assigned to answer which questions and they have to be approved questions in order to do that. I know it may sound like a lot, but sometimes that's the best way just to ensure that there is fair, fairness and equity across a process. Um, because, you know, as you can imagine, when you kind of do a little free for all sometimes, you know, you can definitely get some of that bias into the process. Um, but that's just my recommendation and an example of how we do it. I'll Wait. give it to the others. <laughs> Anything you would like? No? Okay. No, no, it's, I think all he's right. answered. Structured, structured interviews are the way to go. Yeah. And then I think I would also like to add in terms of uh, the virtual uh, pre-screening process, the phone did not go away. We still are doing phone interviews and then we shouldn't undermine those phone conversations uh, because the, the hiring managers and the HR managers are already screening. And then that also avoids some bias in terms of like, you know, how you're presenting yourself and, uh, it's important to critically think about preparing for the phone interview as treat it as a virtual interview as well. All right, I would hand on to Florence to give us a closing remark and then uh, we will be closing. Florence. Yes, thank you everybody. Wow, we, um, so we had scheduled an hour, it's an hour and a half and there's still more questions and more things to say which is a uh, uh, credit to our wonderful panelists and our very engaged participants. So thank you very much. It's definitely been a rich conversation. As several people mentioned, there will be a follow-up. So there is going to be a follow-up email from us in a few days. You will receive the recording of this panel. We will share with you any reference or resources. Um, do you know do, and we will repeat all of the social media handles and emails from all of us um, on the panel and hosts so don't feel shy follow us ask us to connect um, and we will um, try to answer some of the you, you can try to connect with the panelists and, and the host uh, if you have additional questions 
We will also send you a brief survey so we can uh, judge the interest how this uh, particular panel um, uh, met your expectations and what and also what else you might want to talk about in the future and talking about the future next week uh, in exactly a week but uh, later um, uh, later or earlier earlier in the earlier, day, yeah. earlier in the day we will be in three different time zones at least it's it's hard to keep up Early, uh, earlier in the day we will have a discussion on um, how to manage your team virtually. We spoke earlier about retention and about how it's important to make your candidates, one, be a part of your team, feel valued. And uh, we'll talk about how to do that virtually. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, to our panelists who accepted to stay a whole half hour longer. And thank you to everybody. Thank you so much. Have a Bye. great afternoon. Good night Bye. and good afternoon. And thank you, Danny, for making it happen in the background. Bye, everybody. Thank you.